find out how many keys. thank you that we can be here today and God thank you that we can sing your praises and God it truly is a marvelous and wonderful thing you did for us at Calvary and God it was even more marvelous and wonderful the day you saved me God and took away my sins and came into my heart and you've lived with me and walked with me and talked with me God and provided for me all these years help us this morning as we look to you and learn about you and God sing your praises in Jesus name we pray Amen. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ who died for me, face to face I shall behold Him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to see and know. Face to face. 
Christ will carry thee heart. Jesus Christ, who loved me so, face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Now we uh, we looked at this verse, um, uh, verse number 4 and 5 the other Sunday, a couple Sundays ago. Um, I want to look at verse number 9 this morning. Verse number 9. Um, sometimes the Bible has some very peculiar things, but uh, this one has always stuck in my mind. Um, I used to pray this a lot when I was in Bible school because um, I struggled going through Bible school financially, as a lot of folks do. Um, but you know what? Uh, uh, sometimes I still pray this a little prayer. Uh, he's praying to God. Uh, let's start in verse number 7. Two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. So the writer of this chapter is saying, look, uh, God, I got, I, got, I got some requests for you. And I, I, God, I, I really, really need these things. He said, remove far from me vanity and lies. Well, amen. I, I can pray that prayer, can't you? I, I don't like people lying to me, whether it be people or uh, uh, the news media or... or uh, something else. Um, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. And I've, I've often prayed that prayer. Look, I, I have no desire to be a billionaire or a millionaire. Um, I'm not that good with money. Uh, I'd probably uh, waste it or squander it or, or, or just mess it up and, and lose it somehow or another. Uh, but I don't want to be dirt poor either. Uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, God gives me food to eat and clothes to wear and a house to live in. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. i got a little truck out there that keeps it going. And, and you know, I'm, i I got a couple little cats and, and a house. And, and me and Linda are very happy there. And uh, so I, I think God has answered that prayer for me. But look at verse number 9. He says, Lest I be full... And deny thee, saying, who is the Lord? And that happens with a lot of rich people. They get dependent on themselves and their money, and they forget about who God is. Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Alright? So, you don't want to take the Lord, uh, Lord God's name in vain. Um, but notice it says, who, verse number 9... Who is the Lord? Now, just because rich people are asking themselves that because they, they've forgotten the Lord, they're like Pharaoh, they say, well, who is God that I shall obey him? I'm not looking at that little question this morning that way. I'm going to look at who God is. I mean, we can know some things from the Bible about who God is. Who is the Lord this morning? You want to know? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you a few things. Heavenly Father, help us as we study who you are and what you do. And how good you are. And God, it's certainly marvelous and wonderful that you love us at all and have anything to do with us. Help us this morning to uh, understand. And God, help us to uh, change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, in Jeremiah uh, 24, verse number 7, uh, the Bible says, And I uh, will give thee in heart to know me, uh, that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Notice Jeremiah 24 says, God gives you a heart to know him. And this morning, if I were you, I wouldn't be like this rich guy in verse number 9 here and say, uh, who, uh, yeah, who's God anyway? Uh, but I, I would go to the Lord and say, who are you, Lord? Let me know you. Let me know you better every day. Um, you know, God wants to reveal himself to you, Christian. You say, well, he lives inside of me, but that don't mean you know God. 
I mean, you can have someone living in your house and locked up in a room somewhere and never know who they are or what they do. You need to sit down with them. You need to talk with them. You need to spend time with them, do things with them. And you get to know somebody. That's the way we need. Look, troubles can cause us to question uh, even God. Re really, truly. Uh, bad things happen. Sometimes you say, why? Why did you let this happen, God? Amen. Uh, I was kind of asking myself that yesterday <laughs> afternoon when, when I, had, I had a second plumbing problem yesterday. I thought, Lord, this, why did you, why'd you let this happen? God, I need a little rest for Sunday. But you know what? God, God let me know he had a reason. I still don't know what it is. But, you know, we have to trust the Lord. And in order to trust the Lord, we have to get to know him. Uh, he told his people in Jeremiah that he wanted uh, his children to, to know him and return to him with their whole heart. See, God's not interested in half-hearted Christians or three-quarter-hearted Christians or, or no-hearted Christians. He wants Christians that will come to him and get to know him with their whole heart. Every single being of their inner being get to know him. John 14, verse 8. Remember, the Bible says, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Huh. Jesus said, saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He said, Look, the God the Father is sitting right in front of you. I, I'm, I'm God manifest in the flesh, Philip. Don't you know who I am? Well, you know, a lot of Christians come to church their whole life. And they don't know who God is. So, this morning, I will look at seven, seven places. And I will look at seven things. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with each one. Uh, most of you probably know these things. But if you don't know, this is your chance to get to know God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. That's an easy verse to find. First one in your Bible. Amen? Some of you can probably quote that to me. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The first thing I want to say this morning is God is our creator. He's our creator. There's not a person or a thing you see on this planet that God didn't make or God didn't make the materials that it's made out of. I mean, mankind has built many things, but all the materials we have, God made. You say, what about those things they make in the laboratory? They're made out of things uh, that God made. I mean, we just put them together in different combinations, and God gives us the smarts to make some new, new material, but it's still all stuff that God made. God is the creator. Uh, you know, God, God, God made us fearfully and wonderfully. You study the human body. It's a, it's a marvel of, of, of physical engineering. Uh, just the circulatory system. Um, the fact that your blood travels around your body. And then it goes to the lungs. And it needs oxygen. The blood cells. The red blood cells. And in those little teeny sacs in your lungs. Those little cells. It's like a little fill up station. They, they come in there and, and they float around and they connect to one of them things and click, 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 click. They got, they got enough oxygen to do. Then they go on their way and do their thing in the body. It's an amazing thing. And each, each one of the cells in your body is like a, a miniature city. It's, it's got a, a, like a capital, got a little... Uh, cell and a little thing in there that kind of runs everything and it's a little it's got little factories that make things and little things that move just in the teeth it's so tiny you have to have a microscope to see it yet God made all that stuff you know we've struggled for years to make um, you know miniature things um, I've, I've been listening to a couple audio books um, about robots, you know, fiction stories about robots. And you know what? Um, it's going to be a long time before you see an actual robot that looks like a human and acts like a human. It would probably never. Because to do that, you have to replicate what God made. I listened to a, a, a series of lectures on YouTube and it was about computers. And 
they've been trying to develop artificial intelligence. Well, for years they tried to say, okay, the, this computer brain is not the brain, it's, it's a mechanical device. And they, they, they tried to attack it from that point of view. And it wasn't until they actually got studying the human brain and the marvel of what God did in the brain. And then when they started studying that and how the thoughts go through the brain and the little nerve, that they started to make progress about how to make a, a, a smarter machine. Uh, well, that's just copying God, folks. That's all that is. This is the best computing device ever invented. Right up here. Uh, the brain. The God is the creator. In 19, uh, 1808, rather, um, a performance of the creation by Haydn was uh, performed in Vienna. And Haydn himself was in attendance uh, to the concert. And he was very old and very feeble. He had to be wheeled into the theater in an early version of a wheelchair. And his presence around uh, aroused immense enthusiasm with the members of the audience. Uh, and, and finally, in the middle of the con concert, they could no longer suppress uh, their enthusiasm uh, as, the, uh, as the orchestra and chorus started singing the the, the part of it was about let there be light there out of Genesis. And, uh, and uh, they got up and they started, they turned to him and they started clapping and clapping and clapping. And he signaled that everybody be quiet. And he got to his feet, his old man. And he said in a voice, feeble but could be heard around the whole auditorium. He said, no, no, not for me, but pointing to heaven. He said, from thence, from heaven above, comes all. Now, there was a man who gave God credit for what he did and for the talent that he had. Oh, oh we should give God credit for a lot of things because he is the creator. Secondly, he's the ruler. He's the ruler. Revelation 19, verse 6, and the other end of the Bible, when it says, oh, he's preaching from Genesis to Revelation again. Yep, I am. Amen. Genesis 19, verse 6. Uh, and I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, and as a voice of many waters, and a voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And then in verse 16 it says, For he hath on his vesture an honest eye and name written King of kings and Lord of lords. Look, God is the ruler and the controller of the universe. Now I realize he lets the principalities and the powers uh, have their way. And, the, and we're going to study that uh, later on this week. Uh, he, he does allow uh, people to, 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 to manage his uh, creation and his universe. But when it comes down to it, God is in charge. God is in charge. You say, well, what if something really bad happens to me? Did God rule that? Yeah, he did. You say, well, that's not very fair. Well, go read the book of Job if you think it's unfair. He didn't do to you what he did to Job. He took everything Job had away from him. And then he killed all of his family except his wife. And then he made him sick. And then to add insult to injury, he sent his three best friends to sit and give him a hard time for an afternoon or however long it took. Poor old Job. Poor old Job. But yet, at the end of the book of Job, Job had to realize, Job had to admit that God was in control and God knew what he was doing. And he was just a poor old sinner. And God took that and said, okay, you've learned your lesson. You're just, you're just. See, we don't need to get too high and mighty. Uh, God gives us a little bit of a, a thing to rule over. I mean, we have, us men have our families and, and uh, you know, maybe you have some pets. Well, you rule, hopefully you rule over them. Uh, although sometimes I wonder, we got this little doggy who comes down, uh, I, I, down from down the street. She's always sitting in front of my gate. I always wonder, don't, I know she has a home. I know they feed her, but she, she loves to come and, and visit me. Of course, I guess the bones I give her don't help things. And yeah, she comes and gets some bones for me. Uh, she loves rib bone, by the way. Uh, but you know what, uh, uh, people, and then, you know, God will give uh, governors and, 
and legislatures and presidents and and yes even kings he gives them part of the power but in the the the, the long run god is in control a big mean lion meant a monkey in the jungle the lion pounced on the poor monkey and said who is the king of the jungle the little frightened monkey said oh 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 you are almighty oh, lion so the lion let him go. The next animal the lion met was a zebra. He pounced on the zebra and roared, Who's the king of the jungle? The zebra said, You are, almighty oh, lion. So he let him go. He'd go running off. And so the next thing the critter the, the lion met was an elephant. And, and he, he asked the same question. Of the elephant. Notice he didn't pounce on the elephant. The elephant grabbed him and twisted him around and threw him about 50 feet with his trunk. The lion picked himself up and huffed. Just because you don't need, know the answers is no reason to get so huffy. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, amen. You ought to know the answer to who's the king of the jungle or the universe, as it were. Not only is God the creator, but God is the ruler. And thirdly, God is the provider. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, uh, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Variableness and shadow of turning. God is consistent. And that consistentness is a good thing. Because if you're going to want a provider, you want one that's going to be consistent. I mean, you don't want to go to your provider one day and have him give you uh, two sandwiches. And then the next day he says, oh, sorry, you only get one sandwich today. And then the next day, you go, oh, I only got a half a sandwich. Then you go the next day and you get five sandwiches. You know, you want, you want a regular thing if you're going to want a provider. And God is our provider. Every good gift. So every good thing you can think of that you've gotten in your life, guess where it came from? It came from God. You say, but I worked hard for that. I, well, I know you did. But see, who gave you the muscles? Who gave you the brain power? Who gave you the skills? Who gave you what you had to, to, to do that thing so you could have that thing? Well, God Almighty. He's our provider. Makes me think of the Apollo program. One of the best things growing up and look, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and there was no picnic in the 60s in Washington, D.C. I remember 1964, a very bad year. And I remember 1968, uh, there were, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, there were so many riots. Uh, people out in the suburbs of Maryland, Virginia, did not go into D.C. Some of them didn't even go to work. Because they were afraid of the riots and things. But one of the greatest things was the space program. Now, you know, we can debate about the space program all you want to. But to a little kid, that was an exciting thing. Watching those rockets go off. And see, my uncle worked for the Navy Research Laboratory. And he put up satellites for the Navy. And, and we would go down to Cape Canaveral. And we would watch the rockets go off. I remember in Winslow Beach Apartments, uh, sitting there on the beach and watching watching the rockets go off across, across the way. I mean, we were a little, little we were miles away, but you could see them go off and go up in there. And but it was a marvelous thing. And you think about Apollo 11. They went to the moon. And, you know, there's a, a, a space place in Houston that's mission control. And... Everything, and it's in Texas, but everything about that rocket that went off to the moon was controlled by people here on Earth. They, they put the food in there. They put the spacesuits in there. They built the thing. They put it together. All the little, you know, grabbers to grab the dust off the moon, the little flag they put up, everything. And those three spacemen got into that capsule totally dependent on 
the people on the surface. And they were going to be millions of miles away. It, it, it must have been humbling. Because as they came across the moon, Neil Armstrong, he had a little bit of a problem. He couldn't find a place to land quite right. It didn't look like what they expected. And, and Mission Control kept wanting to, you know, say, well, should we pull the plug? Should we pull the plug? Should we pull the plug? And finally, Neil Armstrong landed the thing. And he had to trust in those people on the ground. Because they had to come up with a plan. And, and they did their thing. They got back in the rocket. Then they had to trust that somebody put the rocket together, the little capsule, because they had to push the button eventually and the rocket go off and leave the moon. And if they had pushed that button and nothing happened, there'd have been three skeletons on the moon. Then they had to depend on them coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, hopefully they packed the parachutes right and everything went right. And they had to depend on the Navy people to come and get them and bring them on board a ship and bring them home. See, that's like we are as Christians. We're strangers and pilgrims. We depend on our mission control for everything. And man, God may leave some of the decisions to us. But, but we depend a lot on him, on what he does. Because he's our provider. Not only that, but he's our savior. Hallelujah, what a savior. For 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Our savior. Our savior. Oh, you look at these hymn books. They're singing about one person, our Savior. You, there ain't a Buddha hymn book, is there? I don't think there is. I know there's not a Muslim hymn book. I know there's not a, a Hindu hymn book. Now, they may sing songs to the different gods in Hindi or whatever, but no religion has a book like ours full of songs and full of things just praising our Savior for what he did. Look at that song we, we sang this morning. Uh, oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. Jesus is marvelous and wonderful. He saves us. Uh, and you know what? If, if we're going to uh, grow in grace, it says here in the verse, we have to get to know Jesus Christ. You say, well, he came in. He yeah, but you need to get to know him. He wants to know you. Now, don't you sometimes read the Bible, so those of you that read the Bible, and you get to the Gospels and you see all these 12 guys following Jesus around. Don't you kind of, I do at times, I kind of envy them. That they got to sit with Jesus and they got to eat with Jesus and they got to talk with Jesus and learn from Jesus. Boy, that must have been a good thing. I'd ask him all kinds of questions. He'd probably say, Benton, shut up so I can talk to one of the other guys. Our Savior. Our Savior. Uh, a man named Moody Stewart. Um, a story is told about his life. That when he was a boy. He was greatly surprised one day. To find all the sheep. In a field. Standing. Close around in a circle. Around all the little lambs in the field. And uh, two foxes had run off with two of the little lambs a little earlier. And the sheep at once drove the lambs together and formed this circle around them for defense. Um, the gentleman that was writing this story commented on the fact in this story. And he recalls uh, from other stories that he had heard that wild horses and wild deer uh, do the same thing when they're attacked by wolves. Sheep, um, you know, at one time were wild. And they're, in their wild state, they were far stronger and braver than they are now. And in danger, their original nature rushes upon them 
and in arms of defense for the lambs, they circle themselves and they risk their own lives to protect the lives of the little lambs. Surely the good shepherd, he comments, would defend his own the same way. Again and again, he tells us that he laid down his life for the sheep. That's what he did as Savior. He laid down his life for the sheep. You can't get a better Savior than that. Not only is he a creator and ruler and provider and Savior, but he's the counselor. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is un, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, comma, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, it says Counselor, Counselor, Counselor. You say, what, what in the world is a Counselor? Well, a Counselor is someone that gives you advice. A counselor is someone who can defend you in like a court of law. We call attorneys counselors because they give us legal advice. When you come to a pastor and, and, and you say, Pastor, I got a problem. I got several books in there on pastoral counseling. I become a pastor. I become a counselor at that point. Some pastors are good at it. Some pastors aren't. Uh, Mostly, if they stick to the Bible, they'll be all right. But counselor. God wants to be your counselor. Because he knows when he puts us in this life down here, we're going to have many questions about many things. See, sometimes we don't know all the answers. Sometimes we need help. Amen? We do. We need help to understand. There, there's a little story that may illustrate that point. A fellow said, uh, he talked about the little minnow. You know, the little teeny little minnow fish. Um, in, in, in its world, the little minnow, he knows every nook and cranny of the little the little area that he spends his life in, you know, maybe it's a a, a, a coral reef or maybe it's the, the, you know, the seaweed or whatever. But he, he knows every little spot and he knows every little uh, grain of sand there. He knows all the other fish that, you know, pass through his uh, domain. But that little minnow has no earthly idea of the ocean as a whole. He doesn't know anything about ocean tides or moon phases or, or the storms or the trade winds or, or even what the bottom of the ocean looks like because he's only seen just a little bit of it. It's unknown to him. And if he were to wander off out of his little world, he'd be lost. And that's what happens to us sometimes. We wander off into an area we don't know about. And in that way, we're like the little minnows. And see, God knows that. And God looks at, he, look, he, he, he says the very hairs are numbered on your head. He says he knows the sparrows and he feeds the little birds. And he, he knows the flowers and takes care of the little flowers. And surely he knows the little minnows. He can take care of us. He can show us the way. He can illuminate the darkness. He can, uh, he can educate us out of our ignorance. He can, he can give us the, the, the ideas and the, and the teachings. We need to have the skills that we need to, to make it in this life. Because sometimes this life is tough. We're strangers and pilgrims. And we're liable to get in a spot where we just don't know what to do. So when you get in that spot, you know where to go, right? You go to him. He's the counselor. He's the counselor. Before you come to my office, do me a favor. Go to him first. If he don't answer you, maybe you say, go see the pastor. I don't know. Uh, I, I've, I've prayed about that with doctors and God said, go to the doctor. <laughs> okay, Lord. Not only is he our creator and our ruler and our provider and our savior and our counselor, but he's our intercessor. 
Oh, the Bible has a lot to say about this. 1 John 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So not only is a lawyer or a counselor, but he's an intercessor. You see, when you go into court and you face a judge, and God is the judge, you need some help. You need somebody that knows the law. You need someone that knows all the tricks of the law. You need someone that's been educated how to defend somebody and how to, how to, how to get you out of whatever they've charged you with, especially if you're not guilty. And even if you are, it doesn't hurt to have a guy who knows how to get you off. That's what every crook wants, right? Someone get them off? Well, folks, we're sinners. I hate to tell you this. Aren't you glad we got an advocate with the Father? The prosecutor is the devil, and he's our, he's our advocate. Isaiah 53, verse 12. It says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, that's me. That's me. That's me. Romans 8, 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather than is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He's up there right now. And he is defending us. He, he, is, he is trying to keep the wrath of God off of our, our, ourselves. And, and hopefully, and, and you know what, I, I want to say this. The reason America hasn't sunk into the pits of hell before now is Christians. Little groups of Christians just like this. That believe the Bible and read the Bible and pray and, 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 and try to obey the Bible. There's not very many of us around now. But that's why God hasn't sunk this nation yet. Maybe some of you on YouTube think uh, you're special and God, God loves you special. Uh, no, God, God, God has sunk bigger and better empires than us. We need Jesus Christ, the righteous. Marjo sat in the upper stair listening. Every time a fresh wail entered her ear, she groaned softly in loving sympathy. She had a little scalloped handkerchief squeezed together in one hand, and it was quite damp. Oh dear me, she said. I wish he hadn't I, I wish he hadn't been bad. I wish he'd been a good boy. Then mama would have to put him into bed. And he wouldn't feel so dreadful. Marjo murmured. I, I wish he'd been good. Poor Bobby, poor Bobby, it hurts my heart when he cries so. A new newly enforced set of whales drifted down the staircase, growing more heart-rending all the time. Marjo's little mouth uh, corners dropped down more and more, and the scallop handkerchief got still damper. Marjorie, Marjorie, why don't you come down and play, dear, Mama called. I guess I can't, Mama. I feel so sorrowful for Bobby, she called back. You mustn't feel too bad, dear. Bobby was naughty and ought to cry. Yes, ma'am, I know. She said in a shaky voice. But but you see, I have to feel bad. You can't do it uh, as well as I can, Mama. Because I've been there and I know how it feels. Jesus is a good intercessor because he came. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem. He grew up in a carpenter's shop. He preached three and a half years. He was hungry. He was thirsty. They nailed him to a cross. He felt any pain you can imagine, he felt worse. So he goes up to heaven and he knows how it feels because he's been there. Finally, he's our comforter. Well, not him particularly, the Holy Spirit, which is part of God. He's our comforter. John 14, verse number 16 says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. 
But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You know, Jesus said a lot of things and he went away. You ever wonder why we have four Gospels in the Bible? God did that so we can know that what it says about Jesus is the truth. Four different people at four different times write the same thing about one person. And Jesus said, look, I'm going to send the fellow to you. The Holy Spirit, he's part of God. And he's, he's going to bring to remembrance. And those words are going to comfort you. Are going to comfort you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. He said, but I have overcome the world. Oh, there's all kinds of things Jesus said to us. And to the disciples that we can read and take, take as our own. And he said, the Holy Spirit uses that to comfort us. My radio's been busted in my truck for the longest time. So the other day I was in Walmart. <coughs> And I saw a little digital radio. It wasn't very much. So I said, well, you know, I can put this in the truck. And, and every time I want to listen to the radio, I can just plug in those little earphones and listen to the radio. So I had, um, I forget what Christian station on the other day. Uh, I, I come here. and As soon as I pulled up to the building, there's this old guy on there was singing, There is an unseen hand to me. So what'd you do? I sat right there, just all tears of joy. Because he is an unseen hand to us. He looks over us and comforts us and helps us. He's our comforter. There was a man named Nathan from... Uh, Norwegian, uh, no, the, the Norwegian region of, of Europe there. And uh, he had an uh, Arctic expedition. And he took with him a carrier pigeon. Um, it was strong and fleet of wing. And after two years um, exploring the Arctic region, um, he hadn't been home. In a long time. He left his family. He decided that he was going to write a little note. and He got one of those little papers like you put on a carrier pigeon. And he wrote a little note to his wife. And he, you know, twirled it up and put it on the little leg of the, the pigeon's wing. And he let that pigeon loose. That pigeon had to fly over 2,000 miles to Norway. 2,000 miles. I know what miles over ocean and ice. What desolation. Not a living creature, not a sprig of green. Ice, 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 snow and death. But he took the little trembling, trembling bird and flung it her up from the ship and it took wing. It circled around a couple times and then straight as an arrow headed south toward home. 1,000 miles over ice, 1,000 miles over frozen waste of the ocean, and at last it dropped into the lap of the explorer's wife at home. She got the little bird and she opened the little note and read. And she knew it was okay and he was alive and everything was all right and he was coming home. You know what? We get those little messages from above. We get the heavenly dove come to us. Only, only our message says he's alive and we're coming to him. <laughs> That's what our message says. In conclusion, this morning you got a basic list. Creator, ruler, provider, savior, counselor, intercessor, comforter. There's a whole lot more to God. Man, there's a whole Bible full. And every day, if you will read this and pray 
and walk with God and talk with God, you will get to know Him. And He'll get to know you. And you know what Peter said? Grow. So I say, grow and know. And know and grow. Amen? Know and grow. This morning, that's where I'll be our uh, hearts cry. Lord, let me know you. Help me to grow. Help me to grow. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Linda, come play something on the piano. Softly and tender. I don't know, this morning maybe maybe you need a provider. Maybe you need a savior this morning. You don't know Jesus as your savior. Maybe you're confused about things in your life and you need a counselor. Maybe you need comforting. Maybe you need Jesus to intercede for you about a particular thing. Well, here's the altar. God is here this morning. I give you his word. This is all I can do. This is what a Bible preacher does. Is show you the word of God. And he's all these things and more. But you know, sometimes we need to go to him. And we need to ask him for his help. And, you know, he, he, he's a good God. Very few times in the Bible does he say no to anybody. 